let's begin. Uh, so this week, uh, we are starting with the visual system and the related cranial nerves. Uh, so I'm sorry about the cancellation on Sunday. Uh, the lecturer was ill. So I only had a day to prepare, so uh, I really hope it's useful. Uh, I tried my best. Uh, we can just begin with the contents. So I'll go through the uh, from the outside in, uh, the bony orbit first, then the accessory structures of the eye on the outside, the lacrimal system with the apparatus, uh, then the conjunctiva, and then we move to the eyeball, uh, its layers and parts. Uh, then we move to the orbital muscles, uh, the vascular supply and innervation of the eye, uh, and then we'll finally go into the cranial nerves. And the last thing we'll do is just uh, an overview of the topography of that region. Uh, so I can just start with the bony orbit. So we know that it consists of six bones uh, around the uh, socket of the eye. So the roof is formed by the frontal bone. Uh, the lateral wall is formed mainly by the zygomatic. The floor mainly by the maxillary bone. Uh, and the medial wall mainly by the uh, lacrimal bone. And then the posterior wall is the sphenoid, both the greater wing and then the lesser wing in this region. And then the ethmoid bone as well. Uh, so a couple key features of this area, uh, you guys should know the lacrimal groove in the maxillary bone, uh, which is where the lacrimal sac sits. So when we get to the lacrimal system, I'll, I'll let you guys know uh, what that is. Uh, and then on the uh, right above it, on the ethmoid bone, are the anterior and posterior uh, ethmoidal foramina. So when you guys do the cranial nerves, the first cranial nerve is the olfactory nerve and uh, the anterior and posterior ethmoidal uh, vessels and nerves are related uh, to that uh, cranial nerve uh, and those uh, exit through here. Uh, right next to that, a little bit more laterally, is the optic canal, which is where the optic nerve uh, comes out of. Uh, and then next to that, uh, formed by the sphenoid bone, the greater wing and the lesser wing, uh, together uh, they form uh, uh, down uh, along with the maxillary bone, they form the superior and inferior orbital fissure, uh, fissures, which are the entrance, uh, the main entrances into the uh, the orbital socket. Uh, and this is where a bunch of nerves and vessels come through. And I'll I'll show you guys the the scheme that I drew for that one. Um, what else? Anything else? No, I think that's it. Uh, so just overlying the connective tissue, uh, we have the um, a major structure which is the orbital septum. Uh, this is really important clinically, I'll get to that a bit later, uh, but it's just the connective tissue overlying the, the socket anteriorly uh, and it's just underneath the, the eyelids. Uh, and alongside that, in between runs the tendon of the levator palp uh, palpebrae superior, so the superior palpebral uh, levator. Uh, the main muscle that uh, helps with the eyelid opening and closing. Uh, that runs through and the muscle is right behind it, of course, behind the orbital septum. And then the superior tarsus is a, a disc of connective tissue on the upper eyelid, inferior tarsus a disc of connective tissue on the lower eyelid. Uh, and then the orbital septum thickens uh, both medially and laterally to form the uh, lateral and medial uh, palpebral ligaments. Uh, that bring in the eyelids uh, and join them in the centers on either side. Uh, another main uh, and important thing is that the periosteum, so the connective tissue overlying the bone, is uh, overlying this entire uh, bony socket, uh, is called the periorbita. And this periorbita is actually continuous posteriorly with the periosteal layer of the dura mater. So I don't know if you guys did the uh, meninges yet, uh, but uh, the dura mater is uh, the outermost covering of the structures of the uh, nervous system, and it is just a, a thick uh, layer of connective tissue that 
protects the brain and spinal cord. So the dura mater uh, comes out is an extension of the periorbita posteriorly and that's pretty intuitive because we know that the a major structure back here at, in the region of the optic canal is the optic nerve so that's a, a central nervous system structure uh, so of course it would have dura mater uh, overlying it uh, and that dura mater is continuous anteriorly with the periosteum that overlies the bone of the bony socket and <coughs> This dura mater uh, in this region also thickens slightly to form a so-called common tendinous ring. Uh, so this common tendinous ring is, uh, I guess, it's just a ring in this shape, and it would be overlying in this region. So just uh, most of the superior orbital fissure, uh, including the optic canal and downwards, and just a tiny bit of the inferior orbital fissure as well. And this is really important to know because this is actually the origin point of the orbital rectus muscles. So the rectus muscles are um, the main muscles, or at least some of the main muscles of the visual system, of the eyeball, and they originate, uh, all of them, uh, on the common tendinous ring. So they originate on this ring right here, and then they move forward and uh, insert into various parts of the eyeball okay so we'll talk about the orbital muscles later on and I'll show you guys exactly what I mean uh, so just really quick uh, we can move on to the actual structures that uh, enter through the uh, superior and inferior orbital fissures uh, so the superior orbital fissure outside of the common tendinous ring uh, we have the lacrimal branch and the frontal branch of v1 so v1 uh, refers to um, the first branch of the trigeminal nerve so the trigeminal nerve is cranial nerve 5 so v the roman numeral for 5 and then it has three branches uh, v1 ophthalmic v2 maxillary and v3 mandibular uh, all these you guys will learn when you do the cranial nerves. Right now you should just know that the ophthalmic branch, V1, gives off a lacrimal branch and a frontal branch uh, which enter through into the orbital socket through the superior orbital fissure right outside the common tendinous ring. Uh, and right next to it is also the trochlear nerve which is cranial nerve 4. Uh, that one we will talk about today, so I'll, I'll let you guys know about that. Just know that it also enters uh, into the orbital uh, socket in this region. And then right under it, we have the superior ophthalmic vein. Uh, within the common tendinous ring, we have the optic canal, the entirety of it. So both the uh, optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery enter uh, in this region uh, into the orbital socket. Uh, just below that, also in the superior orbital fissure, we have the uh, superior and inferior branches of cranial nerve 3, which is the oculomotor nerve. That is also a major cranial nerve that we will do today. It is the main one that is uh, sort of responsible for uh, things that happen within the visual system, so we'll talk about that later. And then uh, also we have the nasociliary branch, also of V1, which is the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve uh, and then lastly we also have the cranial nerve 6 which is the abducens nerve so that is the third nerve uh, related to the visual system that we'll talk about today so uh, cranial nerve 3 oculomotor cranial nerve 4 uh, trochlear and cranial nerve 6 abducens all of these are related to the visual system and we will talk about them today uh, just one last thing now we move on to the inferior orbital fissure so only two main things that you guys need to know the uh, inferior ophthalmic vein uh, exits through here technically because it's uh, draining so it exits uh, and then the zygomatic nerve uh, is a nerve so it innervates within this orbital socket so it enters through in this region so this is um, the entire orbital fissure structure right here is really important for you guys uh, I suggest that you memorize the scheme. Uh, I made this myself, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's uh, probably one of the schemes that you should know. 
it's a really important one for if you get the visual system or actually if you get these cranial nerves in your exam uh, any of these uh, they would be really happy if you drew this structure out for them and told them that this is where they enter the orbital um, socket uh, during their pathway uh, so we'll, we'll get uh, to this a bunch of times in the lecture it's a uh, pretty important structure it's a, an important scheme so we'll continue on with it okay uh, next thing uh, do you guys have any questions at this point? Anything? Uh, and you guys hear me clearly, you understand what I'm saying? Okay, then. Uh, I guess we can move on. Uh, all right, so next thing we have the uh, apparatus, the accessory structures of the eye. Uh, so I just uh, borrowed this uh, lecture from the study hub. Uh, it is from a student called Abdullah Ali Ami. Uh, I think he's already graduated now, so he's a doctor. So hopefully he doesn't mind that I borrowed some of his uh, uh, lecture slides to help with my, my lecture. Uh, but just... Uh, we can talk about the accessory structures of the eyes, so the eyelids and the eyelashes that uh, cover the opening of the orbital socket anteriorly. Uh, so the eyelids, they shade, they protect, and they lubricate the eye. Uh, we'll go through the structures uh, from deep to superficial in a minute. Uh, there's also a tarsal plate that we'll talk about. Uh, so let's just move on to actually the actual structure. So here is the uh, eyelid, the upper eyelid in this case obviously, and here we have the skin, most superficially, right under it is the subcutaneous fat, and right underneath that is this large muscle right here. So this large muscle is called the orbicularis oculi muscle, and it is a muscle of facial expression. So it, when you scrunch up your eyes, uh, this is the muscle that you're using mainly, and because it is a muscle of facial expression, uh, in a couple weeks when you guys do the cranial nerves you will learn that the um, facial nerve cranial nerve 7 is what uh, innervates all of the muscles of facial expression so the facial nerve uh, innervates the orbicularis oculi right underneath that is the orbital septum I told you guys that this was important uh, so it's just a continuation of the periosteum that uh, overlies the bone in the bony socket uh, and this uh, orbital septum is uh, just a continuation, a flap of connective tissue, both uh, superiorly and inferiorly on the lower eyelids as well. And this is a really important structure because there are infections, um, uh, namely it's called cellulitis. And cellulitis uh, affects both posteriorly and anteriorly. Uh, and it's sort of a different sort of prognosis in both cases, whether it's anterior or posterior cellulitis. Uh, that's not important. What's important is that you guys know that uh, this structure exists and where it is. So right underneath that, uh, then we have the uh, tarsal plate, which is a thick disc of connective tissue. And this uh, disc of connective tissue is just uh, a main structure in the eyelid because it is where the uh, tendon of the uh, levator papillaris superioris inserts. So this muscle is the major muscle that uh, controls the uh, opening and closing of the eyelids and that inserts into this tarsal plate. And alongside it is also another muscle which is a which is called the superior tarsal muscle and this is a uh, smooth muscle. So the levator is uh, voluntary uh, but this superior tarsal muscle is smooth muscle. So uh, this is more pathology, but if you guys, uh, you guys should know these structures because it's important when you consider ptosis. Uh, so ptosis is the Latin word for uh, eyelid drooping, and there you can have both complete and partial ptosis. So both complete and uh, partial eyelid drooping. And in complete eyelid drooping, this muscle is affected. So in, um, for example, oculomotor, oculomotor nerve palsy so cranial nerve 3 palsy like when it's uh, been knocked out uh, when it's been damaged by some 
sort of some sort of factor and it's not working anymore uh, the ocular motor is the um, nerve that innervates this muscle this voluntary muscle so if that is knocked out then the entire eyelid droops so there's complete eyelid drooping but in the case that the uh, sympathetic nervous system is uh, defective in this region then this muscle would not be working and this is only a part uh, partly responsible for this uh, opening and closing of the eyelid so if this muscle is knocked out because of a sympathetic nervous system damage uh, then they would it would result in partial eyelid drooping uh, another couple things I guess we can talk about oh so right underneath the tarsal plate oh uh, um, another major thing is that uh, the tarsal plate has uh, tarsal glands which are called meibomian glands uh, we'll get to that uh, we'll talk about that more in a bit uh, right underneath that is some more fat that's subcutaneous and then right on the posterior surface of the eyelid is the conjunctiva uh, so the conjunctiva we'll talk about uh, a little later it's just um, consists of three parts and it's a thin mucous membrane in this region so we can just talk uh, really quickly about the vasculature of the eyelids uh, and the innervation so vasculature is the uh, transverse facial to the lower eyelid uh, and the lacrimal artery uh, to the region of the upper eyelid uh, and then the angular artery on the uh, uh, medial side on this side uh, from the infraorbital um, so you guys know that the superficial temporal and the transverse facial artery I think you guys did arteries already so you guys know that these are branches of this artery right here uh, and this artery is of course the external carotid so that moves upwards brings up the um, terminal artery here the superficial, uh, superficial temporal when it moves upwards uh, but then it also brings the transverse facial along this uh, in this level and that you know uh, that va supplies the lower eyelid and then the lacrimal artery from the upper eyelid is actually a branch of the ophthalmic artery which originates way back here like deep uh, in the region of the uh, cella turtica so the region where the uh, hypophysis the pituitary gland sits uh, that's where the uh, internal carotid uh, gives off a branch of the called the ophthalmic artery and that gives off this uh, final branch called the lacrimal artery so innervation wise we have the lacrimal nerve and you guys know that we just saw this up here so lacrimal nerve of V1 ophthalmic so ophthalmic uh, nerve which is a branch of the trigeminal nerve cranial nerve 5 gives off the lacrimal nerve and that innervates this region uh, and then the supraorbital nerve which is also a branch of the ophthalmic uh, that innervates this uh, also this region and finally the infraorbital nerve which is now a branch of V2 so uh, V2 is the maxillary nerve which is the branch the second branch of the trigeminal nerve cranial nerve 5 so 5 V so it's V2 the second branch of the trigeminal and this infraorbital nerve moves upwards gives branches that move upwards for the lower eyelid okay so I guess we did the structures we did the tarsal plate and we talked about the tarsal glands which are called the meibomian glands and it's important to know this uh, later on when you guys do pathology because uh, uh, it says that uh, infection of the glands produces cyst oh I'm sorry it's uh, I guess this is kind of wrong it should be a blockage or inflammation so an inflammation of the meibomian glands uh, uh, causes a cyst which is called a chalazion. Uh Infection is uh, a different type. I think it says it lower, lower down, so I'll, I'll tell you guys that. Uh, so we talked about, con about the conjunctiva. It has uh, different parts. Uh, the conjunctiva that uh, layers 
the inside of the eyelid is the palpebral conjunctiva uh, and then there's also a uh, bulbar or ocular conjunctiva which uh, lines the surface of the eyeball and the transition between the palpebral uh, to the bulbar is called the fornix and of course there's two conjunctiva because there's an upper and lower eyelid so there is uh, both a superior fornix for the upper eyelid and an inferior fornix for the lower eyelid uh, at the medial angle, the conjunctiva forms the plica semilunaris, so the semilunar fold. And uh, yeah, so the semilunar fold, you guys, this should be the palpebral conjunctiva underlying the inside of the eyelid, uh, the superior and the inferior palpebral conjunctiva. Uh, you can't really see the fornix, I guess, up here. I, I guess technically this is this might be the fornix. So the the area where the conjunctiva ends and folds inwards. Uh, so if you call if you call that the inferior conjunctival fornix, then right here in this region would be the bulbar conjunctiva of the in inferior conjunctiva. So this uh, conjunctiva on both uh, upper and lower eyelids it uh, folds medially in the middle to form the semilunar fold, and that would just be this semicircular line where it folds, uh, right uh, next to this uh, pinkish area on the medial side of the eye. Uh, so we can just move on to eyelashes. Uh, they're just, uh, they just protect from the borders of the eyelids and they just help protect from foreign objects and they divert both sweat and direct sunlight uh, from the eyes. And at the base of these uh, eyelashes where they come out of the eyelid are sebaceous glands and these sebaceous glands are both called glands of Zeiss and there's also uh, there are also other glands called uh, glands of Moll so M O W -L, L and both these glands are sebaceous glands uh, found at the base of these hair follicles and an infection of either the glands of Zeiss or uh, more rarely the meibomian glands is called a hordeolum or a sty. So sty is the English name, gordiolum is the Latin name. Uh, so it is uh, H-O-R-D-E-L-U-M. Uh, oh, sorry, D-E-O-L-U-M. So H-O-R-D-E-O-L-U-M. Uh, so hordiolum is an uh, infectious cyst uh, from either the glands of Zeiss or the glands of uh, Mabelian glands. And a chalazion is a uh, cyst caused by inflammation. So, for example, blockage of the gland would cause a cyst called the chalazion, and a bacterial infection um, would cause a sty or hordeolum. So, these right here tarsal glands are part of the tarsal plate, and glands of mole and glands of syce are at the base of the hair follicle uh, of the eyelashes. Okay, so now we can talk about the lacrimal system. Uh, so the lacrimal system is composed of the lacrimal gland and the lacrimal apparatus. So the lacrimal system, uh, the lacrimal apparatus is involved in both producing and draining tears. So tears contain salts, mucus, lysozyme, which is a, a bactericidal enzyme, so it's a, an enzyme that is anti-infective, it kills bacteria. Uh, tears help both clean and lubricate the eyeball. And the lacrimal gland is situated in the lacrimal fossa of the frontal bone. Yes, the frontal bone, so this bone right here, uh, right on the inside of this region there's going to be some, uh, a sort of hole, a space uh, where the gland sits and that uh, space is called the lacrimal fossa. Uh, just uh, makes sense, right? So the lacrimal gland in this area is actually divided into two parts, both a an orbital part and a palpebral part. So the palpebral is the one closer to the eyelid and the orbital is the one closer to the uh, the eyeball and this uh, gland is divided into two by this structure right here which is the tendon 
of the uh, levator palpebrae superioris. So we said that the levator is the main muscle that um, is responsible for opening and closing of the eyelid and that muscle comes from way back here and its tendon comes out here and it uh, attaches, it inserts into the tarsal plate right here. Uh, but while doing so, it actually divides the lacrimal gland, which is in the same area, into these two parts, palpebral and orbital. <coughs> so after, uh, so this gland is now So now we can just talk about uh, tear uh, drainage. So the tear drainage, the lacrimal gland produces the tears. Uh, they are secreted through these tiny ducts. I don't know if you can see them. These tiny ducts right here are called the excretory ducts. Uh, and they move onto the surface of the, the eye. And they move medially because the uh, eyelids are actually structured in a way that when they close, they close from lateral to medial. So they close in this region, right? So they close like that. So because they close like that, the tear drainage, the uh, tears are just automatically moved, like pushed from where they enter here, just right down it, all the way to the medial edge. So that way it both lubricates and protects the eyeball. Uh, just physiologically. So when they do come down here, they aggregate in this region, which is called the lacrimal lake, uh, lake because that's where they come together. They pool in this region. And then this region, we talked about the uh, folding of the conjunctiva medially, and that was called the semilunar fold, so this semilunar fold. Right next to it is called the puncta. So the puncta is just again the uh, folding, the very medial folding of the conjunctiva. And this region is where the uh, lacrimal canaliculi are situated. So there's a superior one going upwards and an inferior one coming downwards. Both these are the beginning of the drainage system of the lacrimal gland. So the tears move through these uh, canaliculi, they enter into the lacrimal sac and then they move downwards uh, the tears are drained downwards and they enter into the inferior meatus so I, I think you guys did the respiratory system so uh, the nasal cavity has superior inferior and middle um, concrete uh, and so these structures that uh, come inwards and the inferior concrete under it is the inferior meatus so the area of the nasal cavity that is right under this inferior concha. So that's where this nasal lacrimal duct terminates. So it opens into that inferior meatus and the tears are drained there and then of course you just uh, um, inhale and you swallow them. And that's the, the cycle. Uh, I guess that's it. We can just talk a bit about the innervation. So sensory innervation of the lacrimal gland is by the lacrimal nerve and we talked about that we said that it was a branch of the v1 cranial nerve v1 v1 also um so v1 is trigeminal nerve so trigeminal nerve first branch which is the ophthalmic nerve so lacrimal gland provides sensory innervation to the lacrimal uh, gland and it is a branch of the ophthalmic nerve which is a branch of the trigeminal cranial nerve then the sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation is provided by the greater, uh, greater petrosal nerve. So the greater, uh, greater petrosal nerve is a nerve of, um, it's a branch of cranial nerve 7, which is the facial nerve. So the facial nerve, of course, all the cranial nerves are parasympathetic. Uh, so the uh, parasympathetic uh, system provides an intermediate nerve which enters into the uh, which continues into the uh, greater, uh, greater petrosal nerve and that ends up in the uh, lacrimal gland so that provides parasympathetic but the sympathetic system also provides a branch from its own ganglia that actually move up 
in the same direction of the greater petrosal nerve, but then they enter into the greater petrosal nerve uh, just so that it can carry them, these fibers, into the lacrimal gland. So both the sympathetic and parasympathetic, even though they're both different fibers that have different functions, they're both carried by the same nerve uh, because they join together. And this is the greater petrosal nerve of cranial nerves, seven. Uh, so just lastly, um, this is kind of complicated. I, I don't think you guys really need to know this. It's more of a, um, I guess, possibly histology, but pathology and uh, later on in your clinical years. This is just a uh, rundown of the composition of uh, the tear film. So tear fluid is composed of these t uh, three different layers and all three different layers have different um, functions and all three different layers are uh, secreted by different types of glands. So maybe we have the tarsal plate, a lacrimal gland, the main gland, and then the conjunctival goblet cells, which are uh, in the actual conjunctival itself. So this it doesn't really matter. You guys should just know that uh, the tear film that is produced that helps the eye, that protects the eyeball, actually has different layers, and they're created by different glands, and they have different um, functions. Okay, so we can move on to the conjunctiva. So, uh, the conjunctiva, uh, this is a histology, uh, histology sort of fact, but I, I suppose it would be right, really nice if you guys knew it. You, I'm sure you won't understand what it means. Uh, it doesn't really matter. You'll, you'll understand when you actually get into histology, but if you just memorize it, uh, I'm sure it'll be helpful uh, if you get this question in your exam. So the conjunctiva is a thin mucous membrane and it is composed of uh, epithelium which is non-keratinized and stratified squamous. So non-keratinized uh, sort of talks about the composition of the epithelium, like what covers it, and the stratified squamous talks about, it refers to the shape and size of the epithelium. Uh, so that's the epithelium uh, that's the type of epithelium that uh, the conjunctiva is composed of uh, because it, it is just a thin layer of epithelium. Uh, so it has three different parts, like we said. There is the palpable conjunctiva, which is on the inner surface of the eyelids, both, both of them. And then there is the bulbar conjunctiva, which is on the outer surface of the eyeball. And then between them, there is the fornix. So the place where it folds inwards and continues like this and it is just good to know that um, at the very base uh, of the conjunctival fornix is also a an accessory lacrimal gland uh, called the gland of Krauss so both up and down So just quickly, we can talk about both the vascular supply and the innervation. So the blood supply of the palpable and uh, the palpable conjunctiva and the conjunctival fornix are marginal and peripheral arcades of the eyelid from the anterior ciliary arteries of ophthalmic artery. Uh, this is probably not going to be very useful to you guys. I guess you can just memorize it now. And when you actually revise the the arteries all of them so all the way from origination to termination then you can remember some of the stuff that you memorized here and you'll be able to you know um, you'll have a m much more co cohesive exper experience so you'll be able to uh, join in all your knowledge from before and add it with what you started with and you it'll make a lot more so sense to you so for now you can just like read through it try to memorize it if you can uh, but it doesn't matter because when you actually properly do the arteries in total then it'll be a lot easier for you to understand and, and learn all this stuff because you'll know where it's coming from so the palpable and uh, conjunctiva and the fornix marginal and peripheral arcades from the anterior ciliary artery which is a branch of the ophthalmic artery then we have the bulbar uh, conjunctiva which has a limbal part uh, the limbal part uh, the limbus is actually the this junction between the cornea uh, and the uh, the cornea here, sorry, which is in blue, and the conjunctiva, which is the bulbar conjunctiva. So this 
area is the um, limbus. The edge of the cornea is called the limbus. So the limbal part of the bulbar conjunctiva is uh, innervated, or sorry, is supplied by the anterior conjunctival artery, and then below that it's supplied by the posterior conjunctival artery. So anterior in this region and posterior conjunctival in this region. Then next we can just talk about innervation. So bulbar is innervated by the long ciliary branch of V1, so ophthalmic, which is a branch of trigeminal. And then the superior palpebral conjunctiva is innervated by the frontal and lacrimal uh, nerves. Remember, we talked about these because they were the topmost nerves entering uh, into the orbital socket from the superior orbital fissure. And then of course there are also branches of V1, so ophthalmic, which is a branch of the trigeminal uh, cranial nerve, uh, cranial nerve 5. And then finally, inferior palpable conjunctiva is innervated by the lacrimal also and the infraorbital of V2. So we know that right below the uh, orbital socket anteriorly is the infraorbital foramen. So we, we saw that tiny hole and through that foramen enters or, or exits technically onto the, uh, onto the face, the infraorbital nerve, which is a branch of the maxillary nerve. And that infraorbital nerve along with the lacrimal branch of the ophthalmic nerve innervate the inferior palpable conjunctiva. So once again, when you actually do the cranial nerves from, uh, in their entirety, so from the origination to their termination, then this stuff will be a lot easier to memorize because you'll know the pathway of the nerves, you'll know where they come out of, you'll know where they branch out and what they branch uh, out into, and you will be able to know what they innervate after you learn the entire pathway. So just memorize this for now or try to or at least try to understand it and then it'll get better and better as you go along. So just one last thing, this is not really important, but uh, lymphatics. Um, there is a superior two-third and inferior two-third uh, sort of pattern. So superior two-third and inferior one-third um, is drained, uh, the lymphatics are drained into the pre-auricular lymph node and the inferior one-third, uh, two-thirds alongside the in superior one-third uh, so this medial area is uh, drained into the sumbandibular lymph node okay so we can now move on to the anatomy of the eyeball uh, do you guys have any questions at all and you guys can still hear me well Okay, so let's move on to the anatomy of the eyeball. So the eyeball um, roundabout measures 2.5 centimeters in diameter. It has both an anterior and a posterior pole, and between them is the equator. So the anterior pole, this, this side, and the posterior pole, this side, and the equator running down the middle. Uh, some vessels and muscles take a meridian, uh, meridional course, which is a course that follows the outside curved line, so the circumference of the eye from pole to pole. And these uh, vessels, an example of these vessels would be these right here, so the episcleral artery and vein, they have a meridional course, so they move alongside the outside of the circumference of the eyeball. Uh, the anterior part contains the of the eyeball contains the refractive apparatus so the uh, apparatus that is responsible for the bending of light rays as they enter into the eyeball so the cornea and the lens these two are part of the refractive apparatus and then the posterior part contains the uh, retina which I guess you could call the receptive apparatus because it receives uh, light rays onto it on the retina and uh, it uh, sends these light rays as uh, electrical signals for processing 
through the optic nerve into the brain. And that's how you see, and that's how you perceive light. So the outer wall of the eyeball contains, oh sorry, it's divided into three layers. A fibrous tunic, uh, a tunic is just a layer. Uh, uh, so a fibrous tunic, um, so connected tissue. A vascular tunic, so one that uh, includes uh, vasculature, so arteries and veins. And finally, a nervous tunic, uh, which is the one that is receptive of light. So fibrous tunic would be out here, this grayish. Um, obviously, the vascular tunic is in the middle, just arteries and, uh, and veins. And finally, the what's called the nervous tunic, well, most internally, uh, which is uh, part. Uh, the retina is part of the nervous tunic. So uh, fibrous tunic, uh, the supporting coat of the eye. Uh, it is divided into the cornea most anteriorly so the anterior one sixth is the cornea this area right here cornea the one sixth and the posterior five sixths all of this back here is a sclera so this uh, consists uh, this forms the fibrous tumor so the cornea is an avascular transparent fibrous coat that covers the iris so this right here is the iris the cornea covers it uh, and of course it's also a uh, refractive medium of the eye. Uh, it has 43 diopters. It doesn't really matter. You guys will learn this later on in ophthalmology, so it really doesn't matter that you guys know this right now. It's just cool to know because uh, it's a, a major uh, refractive apparatus in the eye, the one with the highest uh, refractive potential or the refractive index. So it bulges out uh, onto the eyeball and it is also lined by this epithelium, non-keratinized stratified squamous, the same as the conjunctiva. We know, of course, that the uh, conjunctiva is uh, continuous. So this is the cornea right here, and the conjunctiva continues onto this. So it's the same sort of epithelium, uh, but it's slightly different configuration because the cornea needs to have a refractive index. It needs to have a potential to bend light. Right, so, uh, yeah, like I said, continuous with the epithelium of the conjunctiva. Uh, and the edge of the cornea is called the limbus, the outer edge. Um, so this edge, all as a circle, this edge between the cornea and the conjunctiva is the limbus. And it continues posteriorly uh, with the... Uh, the sclera, and it's so-called sclerocorneal. I call it corneal scleral, uh, scleral. I guess it doesn't really matter, but it's just uh, this junction between these two structures of the fibrous tunic. Uh, the sclera, that is the posterior five-sixth of this tunic, is dense connective tissue. It uh, gives the shape of the eyeball. It's really rigid, and it protects the inner parts. And its posterior surface is pierced by the uh, optic nerve, which forms the optic foramen. So this is the sclera. Posteriorly in this region, it is pierced. So there's a hole in it. This hole is the so-called optic foramen, and this is where the optic nerve enters. Uh, and of course, uh, alongside the optic nerve, there are also small openings for the ciliary vessels and nerves as well that enter into the eyeball. And between the optic foramen and the sclerocorneal junction are large openings for the transmission of the uh, verticose, vorticose veins. So the optic foramen here and the sclerocorneal junction, I guess, in this region, uh, right uh, about halfway between them here is where the vorticose veins puncture into the sclera and they enter into the vascular tunic uh, where they drain the blood outwards. Uh, one last important thing is the scleral venous sinus, so the Schlem's canal, and that is uh, what collects aqueous humor. So aqueous humor is a fluid 
that is formed in this region. We'll talk about it later. It's formed in this region and it moves outwards and it uh, like just floats around in here. And its uh, main purpose is just to clean out the lens and this entire area and uh, make a shape, uh, keep a shape of this area so that both the lens and cornea have a uh, bent shape so that they can actually refract uh, the light uh, physiologically for the person to see. So this aqueous humor in this chamber has to, because it's produced, it has to be drained, right? So there, there needs to be a cycle. So it uh, floats around here and then it drains into this both on, on the other side. It's like a circle. But this canal is called the Schlem canal and it is a sclera venous sinus. So it's part of the sclera. It's where the aqueous humor drains out. And this canal eventually ends up uh, connecting with the venous system in this region. So it's just uh, drained into the veins as well. Uh, so just a quick thing. Um, as I talked about the extension of the dura matter <coughs> that thickens around the optic nerve to form the common tendinous ring, uh, the dura matter actually also thickens, or not thickens, it just extends and it forms the uh, sclera as well. So a lot of the uh, parts of the eyeball that are uh, fibers or that are connected tissue that actually protect the eyeball are just extensions of the dura matter. So the sclera is no different. It uh, extends from the dura matter uh, to form the outer covering of the eye, uh, and that's why it is derived from neural, uh, neural crest, uh, crest cells. So these are just uh, embryology. Uh, it's not really important that you guys know this, but it's just interesting to know that it, all of these parts are just extensions of the dura matter. Uh, so next, uh, I, just, I just made a note for myself on the limbus. That's an important part is the clear, uh, corneal scleral junction. Uh, just the outer edge of the circular cornea. And then I made just a small thing. The sclera begins inferomedially on the posterior pole. So the optic foramen, uh, if you just draw the eyeball, the this is a really bad drawing, but uh, like laterally, uh, longitudinally, and uh, vertically, they are just, if you make an axis, the optic foramen would be on the inferomedial side. And the optic foramen is where the optic nerve enters, the central retinal artery enters, and the central retinal vein exits to drain. And all alongside the optic foramen are posterior long and posterior short ciliary arteries. So posterior short are all alongside this, and posterior long on either side of two big ones. These are branches of the ophthalmic artery and we talked up, up above of about uh, a few of the things that they supply, uh, for example the conjunctiva. And these um, uh, ciliary arteries, they also give off another branch called, called the anterior ciliary arteries. Uh, which come out of the muscular branches that enter the rectus muscles. Uh, we'll talk about that later. It's a bit complicated. Uh, just uh, one last thing, the long ciliary nerves that come from the nasociliary nerve, which is a branch of the ophthalmic, are also lateral to the optic foramen right here. Uh, I just made a little quick diagram about the uh, coverings. So uh, this is the optic nerve, that's the eyeball. So this is the cornea, and that uh, this these all of these coverings. So the m most out outer covering is called the tenon's capsule. Then we move on to the episclera, right under the tenon's capsule, which is continuous with the conjunctiva. Uh, and then right under it is the sclera, which is uh, part of the fibrous tunic. So the sclera all the way up, and it continues with the cornea, like we said. Right underneath it is the suprachoroidal lamina, also known as lamina fusca, and then right underneath that is the choroid, which is part of the uh, nervous tunic. Uh, no, sorry, it's not. It's not part of the nervous tunic. The choroid is part of the vascular tunic, and we'll just talk about that right now. So the vascular tunic. 
uh, is uh, also called the uvea. And it is a lar uh, large structure that uh, is uh, divided into three parts. Uh, it's heavily pigmented uh, and is divided into the choroid posteriorly, the ciliary body in the middle, and the iris uh, anteriorly. So choroid in the back, ciliary body in this region, we'll see some better pictures later, and then finally the iris that moves upwards like this. I guess we should probably just quickly So, all of this is the choroid, this vascular tunic right here, uh, and then it thickens in this region to form this, which is the ciliary body. Ciliary body is a muscle, uh, and it is uh, responsible for accommodation. So it's responsible for the how you see both near and far objects, how you focus on both uh, near and far objects and uh, the ciliary body contracts and relaxes and as it does that it either loosens or strengthens uh, um, these uh, fibers called the zonal fibers that come out of the uh, ciliary body and these attach into this the lens so that's how it controls the shape of the lens and as it controls the shape of the lens it also uh, controls how the person focuses light onto their retina so how they can differentiate between uh, near objects and far objects. Right, so the choroid is a v highly vascularized uh, part, the posterior part. Uh, it's internally to the sclera. It is a pigmented layer. It contains numerous vessels for the nutrition of the retina, which is right uh, sort of internal to it. And it also has a brown-black appearance uh, because of uh, melanin. So just like uh, the cells in the skin that form melanin uh, called mel uh, melanocytes, they also form, they also exist in the choroid and they also form melanin here. Uh, it, it's just, uh, it's good to know that um, melanin uh, has two types. So there's eumelanin, uh, like EU melanin, and then there's pheomelanin, like P-H-E-O melanin. Uh, so eumelanin is uh, brown black, uh, so that uh, causes uh, that type of skin, and pheomelanin is like uh, red yellow, and it causes sort of uh, whiter skin like in Irish people. Uh, so because of uh, this type of melanin, uh, whichever type it is, uh, that would be one of the factors that um, sort of uh, determine your eye color. So of course. Because the choroid uh, continues anteriorly uh, as the iris, uh, the iris is the main uh, structure that um, sort of determines your eye color. And since the iris is an extension of this uh, structure, it also contains melanocytes, so it also contains melanin. Uh, so that's why um, different types of melanin would be one of the factors that determine the eye color that you have. So, uh, next is the ciliary body. So, um, slightly anterior to the choroid, uh, a thickening, uh, which is also part of the vascular tunic. Uh, and it also contains the uh, ciliary muscles. So, the ciliary muscles, like I talked about, uh, contain the suspensory ligaments, which is where the uh, lens is attached to the ciliary body. Uh, the ciliary body extends from the ora serrata uh, to the point just behind the sclerocorneal junction. So the ora serrata is basically the termination of the receptive part of the retina. So the retina is, uh, like I talked about, the part that receives sunlight and it's able to process it, not process it, it's able to change it into electrical signals that it can then send to the brain. So the actual receptive part of the retina that is responsible for that stuff ends here. So it starts all the way back here on either side, and it goes all the way up here, but it ends at this region, which is called the ora serrata. So the uh, ciliary body begins uh, in this region. Like It's obviously in a different uh, tunic. It's in the tunic below it, but it begins in this region, and it 
thickens all the way up here and that's where the ciliary muscles and it ends somewhere in this region which is the region of the corneoscleral junction and then right after it we talk about the suspensory ligaments and those hold the lens in place and are able to change its shape so right so the suspensory apparatus uh, the ciliary muscle contracts and relaxes and that changes the degree of the curvature of the lens allowing it to focus during accommodation uh, it comprises of uh, meridional fibers, radial fibers and circular fibers uh, I, this is kind of like uh, details that probably are not that important to be honest uh, but you can read to them if you want okay so next uh, the iris, so the most anterior part of the vascular tunic, a continuation of the ciliary body. Uh, it is a colored disc. Uh, like I said, it's pigmented because of the melanin. You have different types, and that determines your uh, color, or it partly determines the color of your eyes. Uh, and this colored disc has a hole in the middle called the pupil, which is where light enters into the eyeball. So uh, the iris is actually a main structure in the anterior part of the eye because it divides the space between the cornea and the lens. So uh, the iris right here, a continuation of the ciliary body, it divides this anterior portion into an anterior chamber and a posterior chamber. So this entire area is the anterior chamber. That hole between the iris is the pupil and this small portion right here on either side is a force of circle so it's continuous all the way up here um, and this entire area is the posterior chamber uh, so uh, like I said when we're talking about um, aqueous humor later it's produced in this region and it moves into the posterior chamber and then it moves upwards outwards into the anterior chamber and then it's drained right out here so uh, we were talking about uh, the division of the space between the iris into an anterior chamber uh, in the front and posterior chamber behind the iris and those two chambers are joined by the pupil like I said so the iris itself contains two types of muscles circular muscles which are called the uh, which form a muscle called the sphincter pupillae and radial muscles which form a muscle called the uh, dilator pupillae so these uh, muscles uh, change the size of the iris so as you know you can have midriasis which is a uh, dilation of the pupil and meiosis which is a constriction of the pupil and this these two uh, sort of states are determined by the relative contraction and relaxation of these muscles so the sphincter uh, as you can um, sort of just uh, realize is that um, the sphincter would be something that constricts because it's a sphincter, right? And the dilator, it's both in the name as well, so it dilates. So, because you know what they do from their name, you should know whether they're radial or circular. So, the sphincter is obviously circular because it uh, circles inwards and it as it contracts. And the radial, uh, it, you can imagine that it um, uh, starts. Uh, it originates on the outer side, on the outer circumference, and um, inserts as a muscle. The fibers, they insert <coughs> on the inner side. So, you guys know from when you did um, the musculoskeletal system that muscles contract from their origination point to their uh, insertion point, which means that these muscles, these radial muscles, would contract from here to here so they would move inwards and they would dilate the pupil so you know that the sphincter pupillae has circular fibers because it constricts inwards and the dilator pupillae has radial fibers because they move from inward to outward and they dilate the pupil uh, another important thing which we'll talk about when we do the cranial nerves is that the sphincter pupillae is uh, innervated by the parasympathetic system so by the oculomotor cranial nerve cranial nerve 3 and the dilator pupillae is innervated by the um, sympathetic system so uh, that's why the um, 
uh, for example, when we talked about the oculomotor palsy, so cranial nerve 3, uh, the oculo, uh, oculomotor nerve, if it is a, uh, damaged in some way uh, and it doesn't function, that means that uh, this innervation to this muscle would be uh, faulty. So this innervation would still work, uh, but it would feel like it, uh, it would seem like it's um, sort of even stronger than usual because this one isn't there to keep a balance which means that the eyelids uh, sort of sorry the uh, pupil will be highly dilated in this region so that's one of the sort of signs of an oculomotor palsy uh, midriasis so eyelid uh, uh, pupil dilation uh, is one of the signs that the cranial nerve 3 is faulty in some way so just physiologically we can talk about the uh, light sensitivity so bright light uh, entering means that the parasympathetic uh, uh, system is stimulated and the oculomotor nerve uh, that innervates the sphincter uh, causes it to contract and this decreases the size of the pupil leading to meiosis on the other hand dim light uh, so in the dark the sympathetic system is stimulated and that stimulates the nerves that uh, innervate the dilator pupillae. They cause it to contract and they cause the iris to increase in size uh, or so they cause the uh, pupil to increase in size. So they contract the dilator muscle and they cause the pupil to increase in size and this leads to midriasis. So eyelid uh, pupil widening. So. Okay. So, uh, last tunic, the nervous tunic. So the retina is the inner coating of the eye. Uh, it lines the posterior th uh, three quarters of the eyeball. Uh, it is the beginning of the visual pathway. So light uh, starts by entering onto into the eyeball and onto the retina. And uh, that's where the pathway starts for visual perception. So the retina contains uh, two basic layers, the neural, uh, neural layer, so the receptive layer, which contains these light-sensitive cells. Uh, and this uh, light-sensitive layer, like I said, ends at the oris retina. And this layer is called the pars optica retinae, so the optic part of the retina. Uh, on the other hand, there is also the pigmented layer, which is uh, anterior to the oris retina. Uh, this pigmented layer is insensitive to light, which means pars seca, so seca means um, blind in Spanish, so the blind part. And this uh, pigmented layer moves all the way across the retina and even anteriorly to the ora serrata. The neural layer ends at the ora serrata, so that's how you know that past the ora serrata there is no light sensitivity, but the pigmented layer continues all the way past the ora serrata and all the way to the ciliated body as well. Uh, and all the way to the retina, oh sorry, the iris as well. So it moves all the way from the back, uh, from the region of the optic nerve, uh, all the way to the front and covers both the ciliary body and the iris. And these are the parts of the, the retina that cover the ciliary body and the iris as well. Another thing is the layers of the retina. So this is kind of a, a sort of a complicated topic. Uh, it's not really important that you guys know this that well because you're going to do it much more in detail when you're doing histology. Uh, I guess you can try to memorize these layers. Uh, honestly, if I were you, I probably wouldn't really do it that much considering uh, I know how much anatomy is. So there's no point in wasting your time on sort of tiny details. Uh, but we'll go through it anyway. Really quickly. So, uh, Brux membrane, uh, the most outward layer so it's important to know that um, light enters this way which means this is the most uh, inner part of the eyeball and this is the most outer part of the layer um, uh, that ends in the nervous tunic so just really quickly I'll show you what I mean so light enters this way so this is that most inside part and this is the Brux membrane. Right above the uh, vascular layer, so the choroid, right above it is the Brux membrane. And then right above that, or more deep to that, 
in, in relation to the uh, eyeball, things would be deep, right? So more deep to the vascular layer is the prox membrane, and more deep to the prox membrane is the uh, starting of the retina, uh, the nervous tunic. Okay, so so prox membrane initially. Uh, more deep to that is the retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, more deep to that are um, the layers of rods and cones. So the rods and cones are the photoreceptive cells. Uh, these um, they uh, respond to light in different ways. So light comes all the way through these layers and it ends up on these cells. And through these cells uh, the light is transformed from um, a chemical to an electrical signal uh, in these and then that electrical signal is passed into these nerves and it enters into the optic nerve and then it is taken to the brain where it is processed and that's how the person sees it. so layers of rods and cones two different types of photoreceptive cells and they have two different types of functions so rods are more about visual acuity so differentiating tiny points uh, and also about uh, vision in the dark so night vision and cones are more about color vision rods are actually color blind so cones are what are important for color vision and they're also important for bright light uh, while rods were important for dark light so then right above that so even more deep to that in relation to the eye is the outer limiting membrane outer because uh, the outer part of the eye is down here right so outer limiting membrane, outer nuclear layer, uh, which is the cell bodies of these photoreceptors. And then uh, more deep to that is the uh, horizontal cell layer. So these horizontal cells are modulating uh, neuronal cells that modulate the neural activity between these um, neur uh, neurons, so the rods and cone neurons, and then also these the bipolar cells so horizontal cells outer plexiform layer uh, then inner nuclear layer which is the bipolar cells then amorcan cell layer another modulated layer inner plexiform layer ganglion cell layer nerve fiber layer and then internal limiting membrane so uh, that's really complicated I think the maybe if you just really simplify it so you just talk about the prax membrane uh, on the outside then there's the retinal pigment epithelium then there's the layers of rods and cones along with their cell bodies then there's the bipolar cells then there's the uh, ganglion cells and these ganglion cells have their nerve fibers all bundled up right above them to form the optic nerve and that optic nerve it what exits the eye and it goes to the brain so uh, rods and cones which are the photoreceptive cells then the neurons, uh, the neuron cell bodies are the first neurons of the, so these neuronal cell bodies of the uh, rods and cones are the first neurons of the visual pathway. Second neurons of the visual pathway are the bipolar neurons. Third neurons of the visual pathway are the ganglion cell neurons. And these are what form the optic nerve. Their outer fibers are what form the optic nerve and that moves outwards. So I, I guess that's more than enough information uh, if you get this kind of question. Uh, so another major thing is the macula lutea and the fovea centralis and the blind spot. So the macula lutea is a portion on the back part of the uh, eye, this region, this part of the retina, uh, which only contains cones. So it's uh, it only contains uh, just a high visual acuity area. And the reason for this thing is because because of the way the eye is oriented. Uh, the optic nerve comes out in this region, but the eye is straight outwards in this region. So light actually enters, it doesn't enter straight to the optic nerve, that's the blind spot. It enters straight down here. So light, the first place the light goes is uh, being focused onto the macula lutea. So that place contains only, only cones, um, so that you have the greatest uh, visual acuity in that area where light first enters and 
uh, the visual acuity is even more enhanced in this area because each cone actually synapses with only one bipolar cell. So in this, uh, in the entire retina, all these uh, uh, photoreceptor cells, they um, synapse with several different um, bipolar, like each bipolar cell synapses with like several different of these cells. But in the macula lithia, only one bipolar cell uh, synapses with one cone cell. So that uh, all the information from the cone cell goes entirely to that one cell and it goes uh, for processing along one direction. Usually in the rest, uh, in the perimacular area, uh, so around the macula lithia in the rest of the retina, each bipolar cell will synapse on a bunch of different uh, rods and cones uh, to get all their information and then you can it can uh, list all of its information. But if you have only one synapsing with only one cone, then you'll have all the information from that one cone entering into that one bipolar cell and it'll make for a lot more streamlined process and that's how it enhances visual acuity. <coughs> uh, finally, the blind spot uh, is represented by the optic disc. So the optic foramen of the sclera, where the optic nerve enters, there is no <coughs> um, receptive uh, photoreceptor cells in this region of the retina. So that's why it's called the blind spot. You can't really um, any light that would enter onto this part of the retina uh, is not going to be perceived. Uh, I'm sure you guys have uh, tested uh, your blind spot on either eye, and you you know that you can't see anything in that tiny like circular spot, and this is the reason why because there's no photoreceptor cells. Uh, this is just a uh, fundoscope examination. So just normally. Uh, in ophthalmology, a phonoscope is a sort of uh, microscope that you hold in your hand and you l uh, shine it across the eye. You get close to the patient's eye and you look inwards and this is what you would see. So you would see a uh, an optic disc, uh, which is where the blind spot is, and that's where the optic foramen enters. Uh, and the fovea centralis, slightly more medially to it, or sorry, slightly more laterally to it the optic uh, disc is the more medial structure and then coming out of it are these central retinal arteries and veins um, so they both supply and drain the entirety of this uh, back region uh, so we can move on to the lens it's a transparent structure it is mostly formed of um, water and uh, lens fibers and epithelial cells and it is what uh, both uh, contracts and relaxes to focus light on the eye. <coughs> uh, and so it is a refractive medium, one of the refractive mediums uh, of the eye uh, visual apparatus. So we talked about aqueous humor in the anterior chamber. So aqueous humor is a clear watery fluid uh, that fills the anterior and posterior chamber. It is produced by the ciliary body. So we talked about the ciliary body, which is a the middle part of the vascular tunic uh, of the uh, layers of the eye, and it is actually composed of. So um, you know, we talked about the choroid back here, and it thickens out here into the ciliary body, and then it moves outwards as the iris. So this ciliary body <coughs> has two parts. The posterior part is plana so the flat part posterior flat part and the anterior part is placata so the anterior folded part uh, so the anterior folded part has so called ciliary processes and it also has zonal fibers so the zonal fibers are what connect to the lens uh, when the ciliary body contracts uh, but the ciliary processes uh, are actually what uh, also connect to the zonal fibers but the, another function of theirs is production of aqueous humor <coughs> so aqueous humor is produced by the ciliary processes specialized epithelium of the ciliary body on the ciliary processes produces the aqueous humor it moves outwards in the posterior chamber now I've obviously made this uh, really out of scale the posterior chamber is way smaller it's like really tiny but and just for visualization, uh, aqueous humor is secreted 
it moves outwards alongside the iris and it moves out of the pupil uh, which is the connection point between the posterior and the anterior chamber and then it drains across it flows all the way through and then it finally ends up in the uh, all the way back it uh, bathes this area and then it moves backwards into the uh, Schlem canal <coughs> Right, so uh, one important place is this place right here, the irrocorneal angle, and that's uh, an anatomical angle that's really important clinically. Uh, when you guys learn about glaucoma, you'll understand what I mean. Uh, it is an angle that uh, can be obstructed, so it would, if it's obstructed, it would um, impede the drainage of aqueous humor into the Schlem canal. Uh, and that would call cause a an increase in pressure. <coughs> right. So the vitreous body is a jelly-like substance uh, composed of ninety-nine percent water, and that is um, called the vitreous humor. And this fills the posterior area of the eye be, uh, behind the lens. <coughs> this area is the vitreous chamber. So we talked about the anterior chamber, we talked about the posterior chamber, and uh, now this is the vitreous chamber, and it is filled with the vitreous body, which is uh, composed of the vitreous humor. Now, unlike the anterior chamber, this vitreous humor, uh, this um, uh, vitreous body is actually static, so it does not change. The aqueous humor anteriorly uh, uh, does change. It is uh, produced, it floats around, and it is drained. So it's dynamic. So it uh, changes, it cycles in and out by, from production to drainage. The vitreous body, on the other hand, is static. It remains in uh, the same place, and it is actually stuck in places such as the uh, fovea centralis, the optic nerve, and the oris serrata. Uh, it's actually bound in those areas. <coughs> uh, do you guys have any questions? Uh, I think we can move on to the muscle of the orbit if you guys are okay. All right then, let's move on. So, we can talk about the muscles of the orbit. Uh, so, <coughs> the orbit is composed of seven different muscles. Uh, the uh, levator palpebrae superioris, which we talked about quite a bit. Uh, then we have the rectus muscles, so the superior, inferior, medial, and lateral rectus muscles. And then the superior and inferior oblique muscles. <coughs> So these rectus muscles and these oblique muscles are responsible for movement of the eyeball itself and the levator is responsible for the movement of the eyelid. So <coughs> the levator palpebrae superioris 
is this muscle right here. It's cut at this region. Um, and that is the eyelid. So the tarsal plate is where it inserts right here. I'm sure you, you probably can't see it, but it, it's right above here. And this is here. It, it, it uh, This is it. In this picture, it's this that has been like twisted upwards. That is the levator palpebra superiors. <coughs> right under it, this one is the superior rectus muscle. Um, medially is this muscle right here. That is the medial rectus. Laterally would be the lateral rectus. And inferiorly is this, the inferior rectus. So this, inferior rectus. So superior rectus, medial rectus, Um. Uh, nope. Sorry, that is the. Yep, it is the medial rectus. So superior rectus, medial rectus, lateral rectus, and inferior rectus. I'll I'll tell you how I know that's the medial in a bit. So superior, uh, lateral, medial, and inferior rectus. Uh, levator palpebrae superioris. And now we can move on to the two oblique muscles. So this is the superior oblique. So the superior oblique. Uh, comes out here it um, goes across this uh, corner uh, this is called the trochlea it is kind of a, 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 a lever a pulley system so it moves up here it goes across here and then it inserts into the equatorial line of the eye but slightly medially to all the rest of these insertion points <coughs> so we said that uh, all these muscles actually originated uh, the levator, the superior, uh, inferior, middle, uh, medial, and lateral rectus, uh, recti, and the superior oblique. They all originate uh, from the so called <coughs> common tendinous ring. So, this ring, which is a, uh, a thickening of the dura mater in this region, the dura mater that uh, overlies the optic nerve, it thickens in this region to form this so-called common tendinous ring and that is the origination point of all these muscles. The only one that doesn't originate from the common tendinous ring is this right here. That is the inferior oblique. The inferior oblique actually originates from the floor of the orbit, from the maxillary bone specifically, and it moves across the inside uh, of the eye, uh, uh, the underneath the eye, and it inserts again around the same region as the superior oblique but just inferior to it, like on the underside. <coughs> uh, so I guess that's it. So you guys know levator, palpebra superioris, superior, medial, inferior, and lateral rectus, recti, uh, superior oblique, and inferior oblique. And the reason I know that this is medial, because the trochlea, which is this thing, which holds the superior oblique, is actually on the medial side so you guys can see here that is the lamina cribrosa so the uh, middle of the uh, anterior cranial fossa and on the inside medially on the um, I guess that would be the uh, maxilla, uh, maxilla the maxillary bone uh, is where the trochlea exists so the superior oblique goes from the common tendinous ring across to the trochlea and then onto the eyeball so because we know that the trochlea is medial that means that this is the medial rectus on this edge right <coughs> right so vascular supply of the eyeball all the branches um, all the arteries that supply in this region are branches of the ophthalmic artery so there are posterior ciliary arteries uh, we talked about it in that tiny diagram uh, two long posterior ciliary arteries alongside the on either side of the optic nerve and then short posterior uh, posterior ciliary arteries that form like a circle around uh, the optic nerve and then we have anterior uh, ciliary arteries we talked about these because they extend from the muscular branches uh, that innervate that uh, supply the rectus muscles they extend from these branches and they go into the sclera <coughs> uh, and they uh, divide into the episclerotic tissue and they 
uh, supply that tissue and the conjunctiva. And then we have a central retinal artery that actually passes through um, the optic uh, foramen as well. So it, alongside the uh, optic nerve, it actually passes in the middle in that area and it uh, supplies the uh, papilla of the optic nerve and it uh, branches into uh, branches that uh, go to the superior and inferior part of the retina. <coughs> and then finally we have uh, vorticose veins. Uh, four vorticose veins on each side uh, of the posterior surface of the eyeball. So let me just uh, actually go all the way up to the... So we can talk about the central retinal artery right here with the optic nerve. The short posterior um, ciliary arteries which sort of made a circle around the uh, optic nerve in that diagram that I showed you and then the long po uh, posterior ciliary arteries which were one on either side of the optic nerve and then finally we have the vorticose veins which each go on uh, there are four on each side so just imagine uh, four right just really quickly we can just recap again <coughs> long ciliary arteries, posterior long ciliary arteries on either side of the optic nerve, <coughs> a circle of posterior short ciliary arteries, then the optic nerve within the optic foramen, an optic canal, and then uh, also the central retinal artery and vein uh, alongside the optic nerve as well. And then the vorticose veins, just imagine each quarter of this uh, circle has one vorticose vein. So one would be here, one would be here, one would be here, and one would be here. Right, that's it. So, all right, they're all here. So I just showed you guys central, short ciliary, long ciliary, vorticose veins, and the central retina artery um, exits through here and goes alongside the entire retina and um, it branches into superior branches that move upwards and branches into inferior branches that move downwards along this inside circle of the retina. <coughs> so we know that all of these branches are actually branches of the ophthalmic artery which as you know from uh, your arterial studies is that it's a branch of the internal carotid so the internal carotid moves from the neck all the way through the deep parts of the uh, neck into the skull uh, and around the skull it uh, right at the region of the optic canal it uh, uh, provides this ophthalmic artery branch and that branches into all these different posterior ciliary arteries both long and short into the lacrimal artery into the <coughs> all these different arteries ethmoidal artery uh, central retinal artery uh, all of these ones that supply this entire area of the, the eyeball and the veins follow pretty much the same pathway because they all drain into the ophthalmic vein in the end that drains into the cavernous sinus which is quite close to where the uh, internal current artery is anyway okay so last thing let's just do the cranial nerves that are related <coughs> We are going to talk about the uh, cranial nerve 3 called the oculomotor, the cranial nerve 4 called the trochlear, and cranial nerve 6 called the abducens. So 4 and 6 are pretty much the easiest cranial nerves out of all 12 that you're going to learn. Uh, 3 is the main one for the eye, but these two are extremely simple, so they're, they'll be very happy to, to learn these two. <coughs> uh, you can literally see their entire pathway of these two in this diagram right here, it's very simple. So we'll just go through them really quickly. We can start with uh, three though. So uh, the cranial nerve three, the oculomotor nerve, um, is at the level of the superior collicula. So the, um, you guys haven't done the midbrain. It's kind of strange that uh, your schedule has you do these cranial nerves first because you should know where the midbrain structures are but just uh, anyway, we can talk about the 
mesencephalon, also known as the midbrain, which is the uh, topmost structure of the brain stem, uh, and that is where the nuclei of the cranial nerve 3 originate. So the nuclei are basically the cell bodies. Uh, let me just So, uh, nuclear, uh, if we just talk about the midbrain, that was really bad. Yes, that's it, a bit better. So, this is the a cross section of the midbrain. So, the you guys can see it right here. Uh, this is the brain stem, <coughs> it has this. Uh, the uh, it's kind of cut, but that is the mesencephalon or the midbrain. Then this structure is the pons, and this structure is the uh, medulla. So these three structures form together the uh, brain stem. The uh, topmost part, the um, midbrain right here, also known as the mesencephalon. If you think about a cross section, this part uh, anteriorly is called the tectum, and the this part right here tectum and this part is the tegmentum so uh, the tectum forms uh, so-called superior and inferior critically so <clears throat> this would be the tectum if it wasn't cut in, in this middle part this entire thing uh, so this t on this side would be the tectum and it would form two sort of buttons one up uh, two above and two below uh, so two like this, if you look at it from the front, and two like this. Uh, the two above are the uh, two above are the superior colliculi. Uh, colliculi, I guess, means buttons in in uh, Latin. And the inferior, uh, the two bottom ones are the inferior colliculi. So the superior colliculi are uh, part of the visual pathway. Uh, when you learn about the nervous system, you'll understand what that means. So, <coughs> the uh, nuclei are actually, nuclei in terms of uh, cranial nerves are actually just a group of cell bodies of neurons uh, where the <coughs> neurons of that nerve originate. Uh, in this case, the neurons of the oculomotor nerve originate in the brain stem. So, uh, in the brainstem, specifically in the midbrain. So just imagine in this region, uh, nuclei of the oculomotor nerve uh, are located. And from this region, they move outwards to the front of the midbrain, and then they follow this pathway right here, because that is the oculomotor nerve. So let me just uh, get rid of all this stuff for now. So. Uh, nuclear of the oculomotor nerve there's two different ones um, both of them form one line one uh, fiber and this group of fibers comes out as the oculomotor nerve and then it moves outwards <coughs> to go and innervate what it needs to so uh, we can yeah so let's just move on so at the level of the superior colliculi so those buttons in the midbrain uh, right in front of the cerebral aqueduct <coughs> are, is the principal, are the principal nuclei of the oculomotor nerve. So there are two principal nuclei. One is the nuclear origanus, which is the motor nucleus, and it provides somatomotor um, function. So it uh, provides, for example, function that uh, leads to the uh, motoric activity of muscles, such as the levator, such as the recti, all those. <coughs> and then there's also a parasympathetic uh, nucleus, uh, which is also called the Edinger Westphal nucleus, and that provides visceromotor uh, function. So it provides uh, visceral is like um, organ function. So somatomotor is voluntary function, and visceromotor is um, 
involuntary motoric function. Okay. So these two nuclei provide both um, motoric, somatomotoric, and visceromotoric fibers, and they join into one, and they lead to this fiber. These two fi um, nuclei join into one fiber, and they lead to this fiber, which becomes the oculomotor nerve. The oculomotor nerve then passes through the <coughs> red nucleus and the medial substantia nigra, which is just which are two parts. So let's just say two parts of the midbrain. The this one right here and this one right here, the red nucleus and the substantia nigra. These are two parts of the midbrain through which the fibers pass and then they exit out of the anterior side. So they go through the sulcus for the oculomotor nerve in the midbrain between the interpeduncular uh, fossa. So the interpeduncular fossa is right here uh, anteriorly. If you looked at it in the front, it would look like this. So it, uh, it goes from these two nuclei. It goes between the two, the red nucleus, which are structures, and the substantia nigra, and it goes outwards. The fibers goes outwards in between the interpeduncular fossa, and it ex exits outwards straight ahead, and it becomes the oculomotor nerve. Uh, it goes between uh, the posterior cerebral and uh, superior cerebral arteries. So in that case, let's just imagine that going transversely are these two arteries posterior cerebral and the superior cerebral up here and posterior cerebral down here they move into the page and as they're moving into the page the oculomotor uh, nerve is going between them and outwards <coughs> uh, and then it transverses the dura laterally to the posterior cl uh, clinoid process it enters the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus i'll talk about the cavernous sinus a bit later it goes through the superior orbital fissure we talked about the superior orbital fissure so it goes through the superior orbital fissure in this, in between uh, the common tendinous ring, uh, superior orbital fissure, so the superior branch and the inferior branch of the oculomotor nerve. So right as it enters uh, into the uh, orbital fissure, so the superior orbital fissure, it branches out into two different batches, superior and inferior orbital fissure, uh, inferior branches of the oculomotor nerve. So uh, as it moves out, uh, it goes through the uh, superior orbital fissure, goes through the common tendinous ring, both superior and inferior branches, and then there's also these other branches <coughs> of other nerves that also go through the common tendinous ring. The parasympathetic fibers actually go to the ciliary ganglion, which is between the lateral rectus muscle and the optic foramen, so somewhere around this region, lateral rectus and optic foramen is here. So in this region, there is a ciliary ganglion, which is where the parasympathetic fibers enter. So the visceromotoric fibers, uh, they enter into that ganglion, uh, while the other fibers <coughs> uh, uh, move uh, to the different uh, rectus muscles that the uh, somatomotoric fibers of the oculomotor serve to function. So uh, after the parasympathetic fibers move into the ciliary ganglion, they uh, come out as postsympathetic fibers, which are called short ciliary branches. So we know that the branches are superior branch and inferior branch. Uh, as it enters into the common tendinous ring, it uh, branches into these two branches. The superior branch innervates the levator palpebrae superioris and the superior rectus. The inferior branch innervates the uh, medial and inferior rectus and the uh, inferior oblique and also gives parasympathetic fibers to the ciliary ganglion. So, <coughs> right, so uh, we said that um, the nuclei, uh, the fibers of the oculomotor nerve as they exit the brainstem, they contain both somatomotoric fibers from this organist nucleus and visceromotoric fibers from the parasympathetic nucleus and the uh, Oh, let me write that down for you guys if you want to know how it's spelled. I think that's what it's called. So, <coughs> um, 
So both these two different types of fibers join into one fiber. They obviously have different functions, so that means that they have different innervation points. So um, the uh, somatomotoric uh, fibers, uh, actually both of them, as the oculomotor nerve enters the collantinous ring and it branches into two these, these two branches, the superior branch has only visceromotoric because it innervates the levator papillary superiors and the superior rectus, while the inferior has both uh, visceral, uh, sorry, somatomotoric and visceromotoric from the uh, parasympathetic nucleus. So the somatomotoric fibers uh, go on to innervate the medial inferior and in, uh, inferior recti and the inferior oblique, while the visceromotoric fibers they branch out and they go into the ciliary ganglion and they exit the ciliary ganglion as the short ciliary fibers to do their parasympathetic function. And we know that their parasympathetic function is actually the innervation of the uh, sphincter pupillae muscle of the iris. So for the purpose of uh, meiosis of the pupil, so the constriction of the pupil is a uh, parasympathetic function. And those fibers are actually the short ciliary branches that enter the iris. And these short ciliary branches are coming out of the ciliary ganglion, which is <coughs> being fed parasympathetic fibers from the inferior branch of the oculomotor nerve that uh, originated, uh, those fibers originated after, before the inferior uh, branch, they originated from the uh, parasympathetic nucleus, also known as the edinger westphal nucleus. Right, so uh, I guess we're done with the oculomotor nerve. It's not a bad nerve, definitely, uh, cranial nerve. <coughs> so next we can talk about the cranial nerve 4, also known as the trochlear nerve. This is very easy, uh, one of the uh, few very easy cranial nerves. So it, it's a nuclei, uh, <coughs> its nucleus is called nucleus organis of the cranial nerve took uh, the cranial nerve four, so nervus quadri. Uh, so this is also called the nucleus originis, but don't confuse it with the nucleus originis of the uh, third cranial nerve. It has a uh, nervus quadri, like it specifies that it's for the fourth nerve as well. And this one is located in the level at the level of the inferior colliculi. So <coughs> we know that uh, if this was the if I just if I um, redraw the brain stem uh, the so uh, midbrain uh, pons and medulla so <coughs> uh, just uh, if you want to see it on this better picture this is the midbrain that's the pons and that's the medulla so <coughs> the midbrain is, like I said, over here. It's composed of superior and inferior colliculi, which means that the nucleus originis of the trochlear uh, nerve are located at the. Uh, it is located at the level of the inferior colliculus. So, uh, at the level of the inferior colliculus, uh, let me draw it on, in red on this one. So let's say just around here, the nucleus originis of the trochlear nerve, at the level of the inferior colliculus, it actually exits the fibers exit from it and they exit dorsal to the brainstem okay so they exit from here and they move backwards and they exit on the out uh, on the back side of the um, brainstem and then they go down as this fiber and uh, they become the trochlear nerve so it's important to note that out of all 12 cranial nerves the trochlear nerve cranial nerve 4 is the only one that exits on the back of the brainstem. The rest of them exit on the front. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, like I said, it moves outwards back here and then it's a very easy movement. <coughs> uh, fibers move back from the nucleus. They decussate, i.e. they cross to the other side of the brainstem uh, and then they exit uh, on the other side of the brainstem. So, just 
uh, in that uh, what what that means in that sense is they uh, <coughs> let's say there's nuclear so obviously we have two tr uh, cochlear nerves because we have two eyes so let's see these two uh, just imagine they're at the level of the inferior cochlea, not the level of the superior cochlea, like the uh, oculomotor nerve. So they, the fibers exit, they degussate, they cross to the other side, and then they exit out here. Same with this one. They degussate, they cross, and then they go to the other side. So your left eye is um, uh, innervated by fibers that originated from your right nucleus erginus of the trochlear nerve. So, uh, they decussate, they exit contralaterally, and then they curl around the cerebral peduncle. So they curl around it. See, like, obviously they curl around it here. <coughs> and then they also pass, along, along with the oculomotor nerve, they also pass between those posterior cerebral and superior cerebral arteries. And then they go through the um, lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Uh, which we'll talk about later, and then they enter the superior orbital fissure just like the um, oculomotor did, but they actually run above the common tendinous ring, not through it. So uh, the oculomotor nerve branches, superior and inferior, are within the uh, entering the orbital socket within the uh, common tendinous ring, but the um, trochlear nerve is exiting above the common tendinous ring. And then what happens is that as soon as it uh, runs above it, the only thing that it innervates is the superior oblique. So it's really easy to remember this because I told you guys that the superior oblique has a leave uh, a lever, a pulley system, which is called the trochlea, this right here. So this is called the trochlea, uh, which means that the superior oblique uh, runs through the trochlea as it inserts into the eyeball. And because it runs through the trochlea, it is innervated by the trochlear nerve which is right here. See, it's just, all it's doing is it's coming up out here and it's just entering straight into the superior oblique and it is just a, uh, so let me just show you the entirety of the pathway. So, oh, I'm sorry, it's not right here, right? So if I just show you the entirety of the pathway. So, um, oh, let me just uh, make it easier to see. So, we're going to go all the way from the nucleus erginus of the trochlea nerve. It moves backwards. It curls around the cerebral peduncles. It goes downwards, forwards, outwards. It goes between the um, superior and posterior cerebral arteries, just like the oculomotor did. And then it goes through them. It enters through the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. And then it goes above. This is a common tendinous ring. It goes above it, and it just goes outwards. And all it does is innervate. So it goes above the common tendinous ring out here. That's the common tendinous ring. It goes above it, and all it does, it goes straight to the... Um, superior oblique right before the trochlea and it just innervates it. That's it. Very simple. Last cranial nerve. Again, very simple. Um, so, cranial nerve 6. It exits between uh, in the sulcus between the pod and the medulla amblygata. So, just we, if we go back here, the um, abducens is right here so it actually uh, also has a nucleus organus uh, but it's a nucleus organus for the <coughs> uh, abducent nerve and this nucleus organus is located somewhere in the region of the pons so in somewhere around here so fibers come out and they move uh, out and they exit out a a um, anteriorly because of course the only nerves that exit um, on the posterior side of the brainstem are the trochlear nerve. So these fibers move anteriorly. Uh, 
Oh, just a second, sorry. Okay, we're back. Okay, so <clears throat> like I said, uh, these it, the nucleus is somewhere around here on the in the pollens. They exit out anteriorly between the sulcus, uh, in the sulcus between the pons. So this entire thing is the is the pons, and that entire thing is the medulla oblongata. So this place is the sulcus between the pons and the medulla oblongata. So in the sulcus they exit the abducens nerve fibers exit out they move outwards and they also go uh, in the lateral wall of the uh, cavernous sinus the cavernous sinus is this region right here <coughs> oculomotor nerve moves at the very top trochlear nerve moves under it abducens nerve moves uh, quite downwards and slightly medially so the abducens nerve moves inwards and it also enters into the um, orbital socket uh, and it enters as a um, uh, part of the inside of the common tendinous ring. So it enters within the common tendinous ring right here, uh, right next to the superior and inferior branches of the oculomotor nerve. So it enters through the uh, common tendinous ring in this region you can see I'm guessing it's probably this one right here uh, this is probably it uh, I guess I haven't followed it along but all it does is that it goes it moves out of here and the only thing that it does is it goes I get you uh, they've actually cut it in this uh, in this uh, diagram but all it does is that it uh, goes out here and it just innervates this lateral, lateral rectus muscle. So it goes <coughs> uh, into the uh, cavernous sinus. It runs along with the internal carotid artery. And then it enters the superior orbital fissure through the common tendinous ring. And the only thing it innervates is the lateral rectus. So. Just really quickly, the cavernous sinus, this is it right here. So the cavernous sinus is actually a structure on the on either side of the uh, cella turtica. So the cella turtica, if you guys remember your skull anatomy, the cella turtica is where the uh, hypophysis or the pituitary gland sits. It's basically right in the middle of the skull, if you look at it from the inside. And right lateral to it, on either side, there is uh, the cavernous sinus. So this right here is the uh, cella turtica. That is the pituitary gland sitting inside it, and right, uh, right next to it on either side is the cavernous sinus. So cavernous sinus is a venous sinus. It is a large space where venous blood drains. But uh, important things to note are that there are <coughs> several structures that move past it. So it's a really good, it's a really important uh, thing to know for your. Uh, topographical anatomy because I think that is one of the questions uh, and it would be really important that you draw a scheme uh, similar to this this might be a little complicated even simpler it doesn't matter but draw a scheme similar to this and know what is in what runs through the cavernous sinus so what runs through it is from top to bottom cranial nerve 3 oculomotor cranial nerve 4 um, trochlear cranial nerve v1 and v2 so ophthalmic and uh, maxillary you'll learn these two later on uh, don't mind them for now and then slightly medial to them are the internal carotid artery it sort of makes a circle through the sinus and goes out here as well so it makes it like moves out of the page here makes a circle and goes into the page here <coughs> and then right under the um, internal carotid artery is the um, abducent nerve cranial nerve six okay so I guess that's it we've done the cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6, they were very important for the visual system. We've gone through the eye, we've done the um, 
apparatus of the eye, so the accessory apparatus like the eyelids, eyelids and the eyelashes. Then we've done the uh, orbital muscles. Um, those were important in knowing. Uh, they really help with the innervation of the cranial nerves as well. And another really important structure is I've had this several times on now. So the common tendinous ring and the superior and inferior orbital fissures and all the stuff that enters in, in this region. So yeah, I have these two pictures of uh, topographical anatomy. Oh, so just really quickly, this is the, right underneath this, this is the optic chiasm. So the optic nerve moves backwards from the eye and it uh, crosses here and it becomes uh, the optic tract. Right under this, uh, underneath this X-shaped thing, which is called the chiasm, is the uh, Sala Turtica, which is where the hypophysis, the um, uh, pituitary gland sits. And right next to it is this, the cavernous sinus. So the cavernous sinus is where these uh, cranial nerve 3, 4, V1 and V2, and abducens nerve and internal carotid artery, they're all in this region. So this is a really important topographical structure. <coughs> so guys, I guess that's it. Um, if there's any questions, uh, you guys can let me know. Uh, but I think I'm done. So if there's anything else, um, I'm really sorry, I just realized that people have been commenting and my screen did not refresh. Um, is there any, are there any more questions? Uh, let me just see, hold on. Um, Uh, so this person asked, uh, the aura serrata is the beginning of the corpus ciliare. Uh, ciliare. So the ciliary body, uh, yes, that is the, or uh, correct, that is uh, the aura serrata is the beginning of the ciliary body. And the termination is the, uh, I think it was the uh, corneal sclerar junction. So the region of the corneal sclerar junction is the uh, opposite end, the termination of the ciliary body. That's where the ciliary body becomes the, um, that's where the ciliary body becomes the iris, the most anterior part of the vascular tunic. Uh, you asked, can you explain that diagram you drew again? Uh, which diagram do you mean? Uh, I guess you're probably not around. Uh, are there any questions? Anything else that you didn't find, uh, I explained well. Of course, uh, you guys uh, know that I'm on Facebook, so if you do have any questions, you can always message me. That's totally fine. Um, I'm uh, hopefully we will post this lecture up in a in a bit. So yeah, so uh, you asked, uh, can you explain that diagram, Drew? Which which diagram did you mean again? the diagram with the iris oh you don't mean this one right or do you mean this one Okay, hold on. Just um not this one. The one in gray. Hmm. I 
mean, this one has vessels, right? Oh, so this is the one you mean. Oh, you mean this one? Okay, so you mean this page. Oh, is there like something specific that you wanted me to uh, like talk about? Uh, like the the termination of the vessels or like the origination of the vessels here or the capsules <coughs> oh this stuff So you just want me to explain this, this like entire diagram. Again. Okay, so uh, I guess I can just like redraw it really quickly. If we just, uh, ignore all this stuff. So if we just say, just make like a vertical and horizontal axis on the posterior part of the eye so like just imagine this is the circle that I'm drawing <coughs> uh, the uh, optic canal enters uh, the optic nerve enters in ferromedial to the these two axes okay so if I just take them off make it easier damn it. so next to it or uh, obviously inside are the central retinal artery and vein and also the optic nerve around them that was bad. Uh, the optic nerve around them, like here okay uh, right next to them are all like surrounding them are short ciliary posterior short ciliary arteries and alongside those are two long posterior ciliary uh, posterior long ciliary arteries <coughs> both of these are branches of the ophthalmic artery and then next to them are long ciliary nerves from the nasal ciliary nerve of v1 so we know that the nasal ciliary nerve enters into the uh, uh, orbital um, socket through the common tendinous ring it is a branch of V1 so the ophthalmic nerve uh, and it enters in and it has just like branches across here and here and these are some of the uh, nerves that um, uh, innervate parts of the conjunctiva so these long ciliary nerves 
are from the nasociliary nerve of the ophthalmic uh, nerve, which is a branch of the trigeminal cranial nerve, CN5. Uh, and these uh, long ciliary nerves uh, move uh, through across the eye and uh, go to the front, and that's where they uh, innervate uh, parts of the uh, structures there, such as the clinic tunnel. Uh, and like I said, uh, the ophthalmic artery gives both posterior long and posterior short ciliary arteries, uh, but it also gives anterior ciliary arteries, which come off the. Um, uh, so, it also gives the muscular branches. These are branches that supply the rectus muscles, and while these branches are moving toward the rectus muscles, they give off anterior ciliary arteries, which move anteriorly, and they also supply uh, parts of the conjunctiva and those structures in the front. Okay. Um, I guess that's it. Uh, is there anything else? I guess we're done. You're welcome, man. I hope, uh, hope it was all useful. Uh, like I said, I'm going to... Well, I'll I'll try to get this um, lecture uploaded, uh, and I'll also put uh, the document up on the study hub uh, for anyone that's watched the lecture. If they if they wanted to use any of the schemes, like copy them and use them for their studying, you you're more than welcome. Uh, but anyway, thank you guys so much for uh, tuning in. I really hope it was useful, and I guess uh, your next lecture is gonna be on Sunday. So uh, see you then. Bye.